Okay, um, good morning and uh, welcome to uh, this uh, geopolitics uh, session. Um, as we had a, a first session and uh, Professor Takenaka talked about the decline of democracy uh, in the world and definitely that uh, according to the many surveys that uh, we have uh, more than 20 years of a consecutive decline uh, of the democracy uh, in the world and that is no exception uh, in Asia Pacific uh, as well. But we're glad to see that uh, all panel members today are from full-fledged uh, democratic uh, you know, uh, nations. Uh, but the uh, biggest uh, opportunities and challenges that we face uh, is that the democracy has to go through all the election uh, processes and the things that has been happening uh, next year, uh, starting from Taiwan uh, in January, and also uh, in Korea, uh, they have to uh, go through the general uh, election. And, and not, not least, <laughs> but in, in November, uh, that uh, there will be a huge election uh, coming up uh, in the United States. Uh, but uh, it is not only November, but uh, all the Super Tuesday things uh, will come in uh, in, the, uh, in the first week uh, of March. So we definitely have to be uh, you know, uh, interfered uh, by those uh, domestic uh, election processes in the key country uh, in Asia uh, that will definitely uh, have to deal uh, with the uh, geopolitics uh, in, in Asia uh, uh, next year. But before uh, getting into those uh, kind of uh, domestic assessments, uh, definitely we'd like to touch upon uh, the, the tremendous development that happened in past uh, 48 hours uh, in Hamas, uh, you know, uh, attacking uh, Israel. And that was pretty much unprecedented uh, in a way of looking at the scale of what happened and also uh, the uh, important consequences that were expected to come uh, aftermath of this uh, attack. And especially I would like to um, ask Joshua because uh, he spent uh, many years uh, in the Middle East uh, as well and he's a specialist on Turkey and the Middle Eastern politics. So, um, Joshua, uh, I would like to ask, uh, by starting to ask by, uh, you know, asking what, what is your assessment of what's been going on uh, in Israel and what will be the major implication in the, in the region? Great. Well, I just got off a plane uh, from the United States and I thought we were going to be talking about America's democracy and, and some of the chaos, unprecedented chaos with the speaker election. Uh, now we have a whole new area to focus. I was just uh, talking to uh, a close friend, a mentor, uh, Michael Oren, who I taught with at Yale, who is the former uh, uh, Israeli ambassador to the U.S. He described what happened as being far worse than 9-11. I think a lot of people are talking about this being about 9-11. It's actually worse than that. Imagine the Al-Qaeda terrorists had not only plotted their plans, some of them did in the United States, but they're still embedded within the society and there are hostages within the territory of the United States. So I think that fear that many of us lived through on 9-11 uh, over 20 years ago uh, in those immediate aftermath of the days. Remember, it took a long period of time before many Americans even felt safe flying again. So with what happened in Israel, it's way worse than that. The, the, the failure of the intelligence and security, I mean, the, at, the United General, at the United Nations General Assembly in New York, uh, Netanyahu was there. He was meeting with President Erdogan of Turkey, for example, that hosts many Hamas leaders, and there's going to be an interesting regional dynamic. My, my, my short line on this is this. Given the topic of this panel, What's happening in Israel is going to have a much larger impact on U.S. politics because Israel has always been a major focus. And if you look at, uh, for example, in California, the Senate race, the way that the different candidates for the Senate are beginning to play this out, and particularly with President Biden, who, you know, in his words and in his action has been strong in terms of his support of Israel, the language he's using. But there are many Democrats, including the Quad, that we can talk about uh, that have put out kind of statements that clearly put the focus and blame, and more importantly, the regional dynamics here. Uh, the Saudi Arabia-Israel normalization deal that would have been part of the Abraham Accords, which whatever you think about the last administration, you have to give them credit. Uh, are now dead. Uh, the statement coming out of the Saudis was very disappointing from an American point of view. It looked like we were almost there. It felt like a couple weeks ago we were almost there. That's now gone. The big thing to watch is not just what's happening in Lebanon. This is becoming a regional conflict very quickly. And when Israel says it's at war and he's going to root out Hamas, Hamas is headquartered out of Qatar has leaders in Turkey, uh, and is being supported directly with military assistance from Iran. 
So if I'm looking at this as a geopolitical situation, uh, America's already got a challenge in Ukraine and it's already giving ammunitions. If we now do the same to Israel, uh, America, to put it mildly, will be very focused on this region. What we thought was gonna be quiet and we were not gonna be focused on is gonna change that. So let me stop there with my, my quick intervention and we can go beyond. Sure, um, I, I'd like to uh, move on uh, a bit about uh, how you think about um, you know how escalatory uh, this situation might look like. You you mentioned about you know Abraham uh, you know accord and that has structurally changed the Israeli relationship uh, with uh, Arab states, especially on UAE, Oman, and they are looking at the Saudi uh, in terms of how they can normalize uh, the relationship. So there's something going on uh, between that the how we are dealing with the Middle East has been structurally changed by those uh, new developments. Would this, um, you know, what would the events happen in Israel might fundamentally change the course of what's been happening or it may, uh, you know, come back to the status where Iran uh, is rising power. Uh, that might change, the, you know, the balance of power in the region. Might that eventually come back to the stage where Israel wish to, you know, return to the relationship, or uh, this has completely, you know, gone? I think it's too early to tell exactly, but I fear the worst here, which is that you already had a very divided uh, situation in Israel where many Israelis themselves, many military officials said, we're not gonna support uh, the judicial reforms and Bibi Netanyahu is particularly far right of center. Many Americans that have had lockstep and very strong pro-Israeli feelings basically have said, we're not gonna support a state of Israel that is not a full democracy. A lot of the comments coming out. And so I think that the Abraham Accords were the one kind of thing that most people in this room are coming from a business background, I'm guessing, right? And even uh, this conference focuses on it. And so uh, you want to be able to do business as usual. And the uh, Abraham Accords allowed states like the UAE and Morocco and Sudan and Bahrain to try to get past the very sticky geopolitics of the Palestinian question. Now it's put it right back in the center. So if I'm Hamas, this is a win in that point of view. The question is, will Hamas survive what Israel has now declared as a war? And will Israel be able to destroy and root out this terrorist organization or will there be enough sympathy because you know <laughs> the Palestinian situation and what's going on in Gaza is a horrendous situation and, and you know kind of it's hard to be equivocal back and forth here but you have to be very clear that what happened two days ago was an unmitigated act of terror and that the state of Israel has every right to defend itself the question then becomes the regional dynamics because I'm worried that now that Saudi Arabia is kind of taking a step back will the UAE be forced to do that and countries like Japan and Korea Korea that have strong business equity in terms of the Middle East with the energy. America, in many ways, is now energy independent. It doesn't need the oil from the Middle East. That is not the case for Japan and Korea and China, not, to, not least to mention what's happening with Russia and Ukraine. This, this adds a whole layer of complication that I think is going to only scramble and make elections in other places and triggers in other places even more problematic. And Hamas now gets to play the role as a spoiler. My biggest fear is Iran, because there was already a push towards uh, doing something about Iran. Uh, there's already been reports in the Wall Street Journal that uh, Iran is directly tied. If, if Israel decides to strike Iran a little bit like the United States struck Iraq after 9-11, I think that's regional war at, at its finest. Sure. Um, one more question before getting into um, East Asia. Uh, Intel failure uh, that you mentioned and uh, Jane Harmon at the first session also reiterated. Why did it happen? Why that uh, Intel, uh, which is supposed to be the one, you know, one of the top rate uh, in the world, Mossad, CIA, and uh, all tracking the daily about the what's been happening in Gaza, West Bank, and so on, why did, why they were not able to, uh, you know, detect what happened in past hours? We're going to be studying this for a long time. As I mentioned, Michael Oren wrote the book on the Yom Kippur War. This happened literally 50 years to the one day. Uh, of the last major uh, you know, uh, failure of this sort. My assumption, and given that this room is filled with probably tech entrepreneurs as well, the vaunted Israeli innovation state and the startup nation, with all of its sophistication, was not able to prevent a pretty unsophisticated attack, in the sense that this seems like when you have paramilitary gliders flying in, you have people coming in, breaking through. I mean, this is basically uh, 
almost a suicide mission uh, in the case of Hamas. And so if people are willing to give their life up and they're willing to die for a cause, no matter how sophisticated, whatever sigint you have or human you have, you can't stop this. And so I think the 20 years of kind of Israel's kind of ability to protect itself by building walls and not having to accommodate the Palestinians or a two-state solution, the question is what happens with that? Two-state solution was already on its deathbed. The question is how this plays out politically in Israel. Everybody's going to unify around and rally the flag, as we say. The question is, how will that play out, and how will others take sides here? And that takes us directly to the, the question of this panel. And I think the question is, what will we be learning from this? And will uh, Bibi, in particular, learn from this and go in with a humility to approach it? Or will he try to push even further ahead and say, that's exactly why we're going to do everything we can, which will only create a larger backlash? Right now, there's a lot of sympathy. After this, I, I suspect that going back to the old Arab-Israel type of conflict, it's only going to reinforce it. Well, thank you, Josia, for your real-time take on what's been happening uh, in Israel. Now, I would like to um, come back to the original agenda uh, to ask uh, ask Foucault. Um, he, he's, he's from Taiwan. Uh, he is uh, one of the most well-known uh, security experts uh, there. And uh, definitely everybody in, in this room is watching about the outcome of the Taiwanese uh, election uh, next year and how it, it, it would take as an uh, you know, important benchmark to see our prospect of uh, you know, the tensions in the cross-strait relationship and the future of the U.S.-Taiwan uh, uh, relationship. So, Fuko, could you, you know, let us know what, what is your take uh, on the, wh what's going to happen uh, in the election and the implication for the stability of uh, Taiwan Strait? <coughs> um, thank you so much. Uh, this morning, I actually prepared uh, a few key points, but after went through two uh, particular sessions, I know that the job is much more complicated and more difficult. And I want to start by thanking uh, the organizer and also uh, Ken for inviting me here, because uh, many of you know that wherever you go, you may not have uh, heard uh, Taiwanese uh, voice or people. And we really go along very much uh, with the uh, uh, spirit of uh, G1 Global Conference here, which is uh, outside of uh, official structure limitation. And I, I think in the remaining 10, ten minutes, I try to cover uh, following Joshua's uh, very effective uh, step, uh, very quick, uh, elaborating into four specific points. The first point I prepare, the first uh, uh, mis-image uh, people carry. I think up to this morning, people are still hearing whether it would be safe build uh, our wonderful speakers uh, in the first panel. Uh, he is traveling to Taiwan, and people are still wondering whether he may be traveling back <laughs> <laughs> after he travel, travels to Taiwan. I, I should uh, re-emphasize, Taiwan today is a very peaceful and safe, uh, just uh, such a tension uh, swirling around Taiwan. And I'm just uh, coming from Taiwan, so I know exactly what happened over there. So this is the first point. Second point, people are wondering if uh, Taiwan is now most dangerous uh, place on Earth is except Israel. Um, I can tell you the war is not coming. And I share very much uh, with uh, those who are uh, closely affiliated with industry. They have more down-to-earth effective uh, analysis than politician. While pe politician in Washington, D.C. always uh, remind us in Taiwan and also probably in East Asia, the war is uh, happening anytime soon. You need to get prepared, purchase more, and the weapon would have to come from the United States. So many of us uh, pay huge money in order to safeguard our national defense. But I can tell you today, uh, the war is not coming. I share very much uh, with the uh, last uh, panels, panelists. Their analysis in, is much closer to what I read uh, in the past. So the second message is the war is not coming. I should leave this uh, to our moderator. He has a really strategic uh, question uh, following through later on. The third point, uh, Taiwan is not that big, but we happens to be stacking in between China and the United States, strategically. But now, it happens that many people know the most advanced chips, uh, more than 90% uh, 
uh, produced in, in Taiwan. So it makes us critically important, even if uh, we may not have uh, direct official links with many of you, uh, your home country, but I, I can assure you, Taiwan becomes uh, critical, critically important for everyone. So with this, um, I just uh, also heard uh, the comment made by one of the panelists uh, earlier. Uh, there is a strong push diversifying supply chain on the semiconductor area, which uh, many countries, the United States, European country, Japan, are now hoping at least uh, those uh, uh, manufacturers uh, center can be gradually uh, shifting away from uh, Taiwan in order to de-risking uh, such a things. But I'm Taiwanese. I'm worrying. As a result, probably Taiwan will be holding out completely with that. But of course, I know uh, TSMC is coming up with its uh, strategic planning. Uh, before uh, President Donald Trump, TSMC had uh, such a global uh, deployment. Headquarters, uh, in Taiwan, but now it is uh, pushed by geopolitical reason. The, the company would have to diversify, making different plans. And uh, I know those uh, uh, top managers in TSMC has a, have a hard time lately. And that is also a reason why in the past, business uh, community does not, uh, did not really care about geopolitics. They would leave this question to experts and, and also government officials. But now, they have to combine these uh, forces together. And early last year, for the first time, TSMC posed a job uh, requirement. They are seeking for those experts, as we are, political scientists, risk uh, uh, analysts, who can tell them how exactly they can sail away from all those uh, geopolitical risks. Uh, this would be the third one. The final one, uh, many people are very curious. I think next year, many countries will have a general election, but the most critical one may be Taiwan's uh, uh, presidential election, because uh, currently, uh, the ruling party in Taiwan has a different approach from the previous one, hopefully maybe different from the next one. Because if uh, uh, the government in Taiwan continuously follow on what we are doing at this moment, the war comes much closer and the possibility will become much higher. So people are worrying. Our uh, voters in Taiwan today, for especially the young people, they are worrying if they join the army or uh, next year, uh, if the ruling party candidates can be elected, the war may be coming. So I, I do sense uh, those uh, points just raised by Joshua about Israel and Hamas. Maybe another reminder for Taiwanese next year before they decide who is going to lead the country next year, they will make particular concern about the war. So the election is coming, but uh, I always uh, mention to our friends here, our opposition leaders uh, currently are trying to uh, negotiate find the best position, uh, but I, I do believe uh, by uh, middle of uh, next month, November, uh, the opposition can three candidates at this moment would be able to form into a one team, and that would be something critical. As long as uh, they can form a team together, they might change the poll in Taiwan, and that may bring different, different dream or different hope. Uh, for Taiwan as well as uh, for the region. Nobody now uh, wants to have an uh, extra war except uh, Ukraine and also Hamas attacking Israel. If there would be another one, I think we will have a really, really long time, uh, uh, hard day uh, ahead, ahead of us, especially East Asia has been powerhouse uh, for global economy. We cannot really afford to have uh, anything going forward. So that would be something uh, we need to work together, help Taiwan to deter uh, something coming toward us. I will stop here. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Fuko, for your comprehensive uh, analysis on uh, the assessment on, on Taiwan. Something I, I would like to um, dig into it is your assessment about the candidates. 
Um, currently, that uh, DPP leader uh, William Lai takes the lead uh, in the uh, the public poll uh, for the favorites uh, for the next presidents. But you also mentioned about there will be a possibility of uh, coalitions uh, among the uh, opposition uh, party members, which may overtake uh, as a uh, uh, you know uh, the uh, collective uh, sense of uh, you know supporting they uh, they have. But uh, according um, according to many kind of uh, you know surveys that conducted in Taiwan, there has been the generating of the so-called Taiwan identity, and uh, there has been a much more uh, you know Taiwan politics is also polarized. But in a sense of identity issue, there has been the emergence of the second and third generation of the Taiwanese who wish to uh, you know, um, uh, regard their Taiwanese identity as a most important way uh, that to maintain their status quo. So in, in your sense, how different uh, that is to select the DPP leaders and the KMT-led coalition leaders as an outcome of the, you know, the strategic outcomes of the Taiwanese future? Um, if uh, there were no uh, uh, Taiwan Strait crisis uh, since uh, last uh, last year, aug uh, August, after uh, Madame uh, Nancy Pelosi's uh, visit to Taipei, I don't think uh, people will change their mindset, as uh, Ken just mentioned. Uh, traditionally, Taiwan identity has been establishing very different from uh, today's uh, China, Chinese uh, identity. They want to live outside of a uh, communist uh, society. They want to stay uh, completely alone and we can do ourselves and keep our economic uh, growing. But uh, things change after security challenge uh, comes to us. So I do, as I mentioned briefly, uh, now voters, except those uh, traditional supporters for different camp, basically young people will become very selective. They want to make sure the next leaders in Taiwan can bring us a peace, keep us uh, developing further not uh, plunge into war with, with China, which we cannot afford, uh, not just Taiwan, but also the entire region. So uh, with this uh, interruption, I think security challenge becomes uh, a top priority for everyone to think, and especially looking into such a sudden attack uh, by Hamas uh, to Israel. The war becomes uh, such a terrible thing for many of us, so I do think uh, it will become a reminder, serious uh, reminders for voters and Taiwanese people to think that we definitely uh, should try to avoid uh, such a challenge for us. Thank you. So I, I like to turn over to Gina. Uh, thank you for participating this this uh, G1 uh, Global from Seoul. Um, from Japanese perspective, um, the President Yoon Suk Yeol uh, did a tremendous job uh, in mitigating the tension of uh, long-standing Japan-Korea uh, relationship. We came up uh, with, uh, you know, great reconciliation between two leaders, and uh, you know, pro we promised to have a shadow diplomacy between two sides. And the many of the missing link uh, in Northeast Asia has now been connected uh, throughout our, uh, you know, relationship has. Uh, generated, uh, you know, the momentum for a trilateral relationship that led to the historic, uh, you know, Camp David Accord uh, trilateral relationship has been uh, moving forward. And Korea now uh, has its own Indo-Pacific strategy that is uh, way beyond that, you know, traditional kind of prioritization of the, you know, uh, North-South uh, relationship to a much larger uh, way that the South Korea now uh, looking uh, to the world as uh, much more uh, like a strategic space uh, than uh, ever before. And from, from Tokyo's perspective, that is great. But uh, at the same time that the reality of the domestic uh, you know, Korean politics, uh, you know, has to rely on uh, the other hand that you also have a very uh, strong progressive, uh, you know, undertaking uh, in the uh, Korean politics. And we wonder how consistent 
uh, that the Korean foreign policy might look like uh, in the coming uh, years. So uh, first of all, I, I'd like to know from Gina uh, is that, uh, you know, how, how do you really uh, have a kind of prospect uh, of the Korea's, uh, you know, foreign policy in coming uh, years? To what extent that we can really uh, rely on such kind of, uh, you know, current uh, you know, trend that is uh, taking place, and how important the upcoming election and the president election in the coming years might affect to the change of the Cor Korean foreign policy. Gina? Yes, thank you. Um, what is driving South Korea's foreign policy? I think, uh, first, anxiety, second, uncertainty. <laughs> the strategic uh, divide between China and the U.S. has gradually deepened in recent years, and in the eyes of uh, most South Koreans, China is becoming increasingly uh, clear in its ambition to engage in strategic competition with the U.S. And South Koreans are witnessing that China is modernizing the PLA to improve its performance in all domains of warfare. And China has recently increased the level of military activities in this region. And China and Russia held six joint military exercises last year alone, uh, including a joint naval and air exercise in uh, the waters off the east coast of the Korean Peninsula. So it is natural that enhancing China's um, um, expeditionary operational capabilities is becoming a serious concern for a country located nearby, just like South Korea. So for some time now, some have argued that China, uh, sorry, South Korea and Japan do not have the same threat perceptions about China, but I think it is incorrect. According to Pew Research, South Korea's negative perception of China is 77% uh, this year. And anti-China sentiment in South Korea has surged from uh, 37% in 2015 to 61% uh, in 2017 when we had that uh, incident. And the top reason for South Korea's negative perception of China was China's influence on the global security environment. And South Korea's balancing against China with the uh, US is not surprising. It is not just because of the change of the government with more conservatives in the presidential office, but the change of the security environment. And the UN uh, administration has embraced the frame of democracy versus authoritarianism in South Korea's uh, politics. And it is projecting into its foreign policy as well. Well, liberals prefer a balanced approach to both the US and China because of uh, some concerns about our economic situation. However, we all share similar concerns. That is second, uncertainty. Uncertainty in our international security environment, which continues to increase due to rivalry and, and competition and the intensifying strategic competition between the US and China and especially after the war in Ukraine have rise, given rise to a more fluid international order. So there is a lot of public concern and anxiety, especially among South Korean companies about which raw materials, for example, will be cut off in the future. So South Korea has only recently begun to address economic security concerns at the governmental level, and China is the center of this concern. So many South Koreans are um, concerned about expert controls can be uh, recognized for strategic and political reasons. In South Korea, under the UN administration, vowed to increase solidarity among democratic countries, which is a costly statement in my opinion. This signals South Korea's commitment to contributing to the global partnership led by the US. And the recent outcome, um, is Camp David a summit, like you mentioned. Historically, the US actions to address abandonment concerns have been to uh, help South Korea strengthen its military, conduct military exercises to improve joint operational capabilities or establish bilateral security consultation mechanisms uh, so that we can communicate and discuss directly uh, between the two uh, countries. The institutionalization of a trilateral security uh, cooperation mechanism um, at the, decided at the Camp David summit was intended to ensure the sustainability of the cooperation 
even in the face of political fluctuations somehow in each country in the coming years. During the press conference, um, President Biden actually emphasized a new era. And he said uh, also that he was building decades and decades of relationships. But um, my, from my perspective, and, and some also worry that uh, it remains to be seen how unshakable this institutional mechanism uh, will be for the Kim David principles to be more than a declaration. Well, then concrete implementation measures addressing a range of issues must be uh, negotiated um, and, uh, between the three countries. And in, a, in addition to regular joint exercises, sharing of real-time um, missile warnings and a response group to North Korea cyber activities, actually a variety of other areas of cooperation have emerged on the agenda including financial cooperation, early warning system for supply chain crisis, cooperation in scientific and uh, innovation, and uh, efforts to empower women in the workforce. So it'll be important for officials from the ministries of foreign affairs, defense, commerce, and many others to discuss what they can accomplish in the real world. There are also differences in how the US and South Korea analyze the meaning of this Camp David summit. It is somewhat troubling um, for some South Koreans that some leading US media outlets are treating, uh, are, are, are calling the, the Camp David talk as the beginning of a new trilateral military alliance. And some South Korean experts have said that South Korea should consider how much of an independent voice it can have on what the US and Japan agree on. So even as trilateral cooperation continues to strengthen, well, the three countries will, will, will continue to uh, make sure that we have uh, you know, shared interest and aligned position on every issue. So discussion should continue to narrow the gap in our perspectives. I'll stop there, thank you. Well, thanks, Gina. Um, we recall that uh, the, the spirit of uh, you know Camp David uh, agreement is to make sure that uh, you know whoever become the president will continue uh, the notion of the commitment to consult uh, with each other. Uh, and uh, many Japanese interpret that that is the case for South Korea. Well, whenever election you know result might happen, that, that we do have a trilateral cooperation. But I think we are also having a tacit you know, kind of message that, the, that that's also applicable for United States <laughs> as well. Yeah. Right. So, but Gina, uh, you know, quickly that uh, if, you know, um, Chairman Kim Jong-un will be here, he might say that uh, don't forget us. <laughs> and and uh, I wonder how concerned uh, you are uh, on the, uh, on, on North Korea, you know, current uh, nuclear missile uh, developments, would there be an, uh, any kind of provocation from North Korea in coming years and how risky uh, your assessment uh, might look like? Well, we were very concerned about that. Um, in um, April last year, in an address during a military parade on the anniversary of the Korean People's Army, uh, Chairman Kim stated that North Korea will develop its nuclear force as quickly as possible and during the Supreme People's Assembly in September, uh, Kim again mentioned that he is determined to upgrade North Korea's nuclear and missile capabilities qualitatively and quantitatively. And North Korea is, uh, and it is not responding to uh, the demand by the rock side to hold dialogue, showing indifference to South Korea's proposal of audacious initiative. In, in Korean, we call it 담대한 구상 and engaging in an action that were in defiance of both the uh, comprehensive military agreement. So deteriorating relations with North Korea have paved the way for South Korea to increase military cooperation with the US and Japan, indeed. In the absence of dialogue with North Korea, well, China's leverage over Pyongyang becomes less meaningful and the relative decline in China's strategic importance for South Korea makes it easier for South Korea to choose between uh, the US and, and China. And the result is you know, aligning with uh, the US. 
Um, so uh, the bellicose nerd cream behavior is likely to uh, have two implications. A strengthened by part, uh, trilateral alliance uh, cooperation between Seoul, Tokyo, and Washington, which is not in North Korea's interest. The conflict between Russia and the West results in the reemergence of op opposing blocs. So we are very, very concerned about the recent move by uh, Chairman Kim and President Putin. The summit shows that North Korea is piggybacking to maximize gains uh, from this rivalry. And the recent move will make a pathway wide open for North Korea to pursue an even more robust, robust missile testing regime. And it will boldly accelerate the speed of nuclear and missile development. It'll make South Korea further expand its defense cooperation network with allies and partners to take you know, counter actions against all legal activities. Thanks. Well, thank you, uh, Gina, for your uh, takes. Um, we cannot open the floor without hearing from Joshua about the prospect of the United States and um, what's going to happen uh, next year. So I thought I could get away with this. I was really excited to not talk about the elephant in the room. <laughs> the elephant and the donkey, I should say, actually. OK, um, but it's your take. And then um, whatever you want to say to this audience about what's going to happen next year. Well, I, I really appreciate the way you framed it for both of my panelists and, and the moderator. I think it's sometimes easy when you're in America to only see the bubble as we see it. And I think it's actually gotten worse uh, with the polarization in our country. Washington has become a political theater. And I think what you need to understand in Tokyo is that what you see playing out on theater is a little bit like Kabuki, right? If you focus on the main actor, you're missing the plot line. And so you need to be focusing on the new era. And, and I appreciated the way that uh, Gina talked about the new era. If Biden and Trump represent the new era as 80-year-olds, we've got a real problem in my country. So that's not a political statement. It's a statement of fact for the United States. I'm very concerned that under the last administration, there was no war in Ukraine, there was no war in Israel, there was no kind of major Taiwan thing, and can't we all just get along? Um, now we've got three, at least, that we've already discussed, uh, hot wars, and now you add American domestic politics in. We had a speaker that lasted you know, nine months uh, and basically was being held hostage by a certain faction of his own party. Uh, in the midst of this Congress, I mean, the President of the United States is the commander in chief. He has the ultimate authority when it comes to uh, war and peace, but the people that pay for it, that's the House, that's the Congress. So until we have a speaker, no matter what we want to do for Israel, we will not be able to get the aid to them. And so I think the way that impacts, particularly the, the region we're talking about, is all these conversations that in the past we would say, well, let's look at domestic Japanese and Korean politics. Now you have to look at American politics. And you, we talked about Taiwan. You had not just Nancy Pelosi, but Kevin McCarthy going to Taiwan. Every congressional delegation stops in Taiwan. And what I heard from you saying is, please don't pay too much attention to us because it's stoking the fire. Sometimes we talk about the tail wagging the dog, and I think that's particularly dangerous. And I think for this audience, what I want to emphasize is this. The U.S.-Japan alliance has been the bedrock of this region for so long, but often we only focused on the Nagatocho, Tokyo, and Washington angle. In America, there is a new dynamic. You need to focus on Silicon Valley when it comes to innovation. You need to focus on New York when it comes to finance and culture. And of course, you look at Washington. But if I'm looking at Democratic politics, that's driven by California and New York. Republican politics is Texas and Florida. So do not be distracted at kind of the political theater sometimes. That comes with good and bad. The last point I will make here is um, I, I really am concerned that no matter what happens with the next election, both sides are going to dispute it. It doesn't matter who wins. It's going to be even more divided than we've ever seen. So in an environment in which democracy seems to already be a pretty dysfunctional way of making major decisions, how can we move forward? And in this regard, let me pay great respect to Korea and Japan. They just were awarded this major uh, you know, profile and cur courage by the JFK Award. And I think looking at President Yoon and Kishida that took major challenges domestically. There are a lot of conservatives and others on both sides and progressives who don't like what they're doing. And the United States has to create a space with its good offices. And if America is distracted with two hot wars, with two countries that we say we have to be able to figure out how to deal with this, the other dragon that we haven't talked about is China. So China has already made its position fairly clear on Ukraine. It's not going to weigh, it's not going to get involved. On Israel, it could be even more dynamic because I think Israel has the potential to strike in a way that could 
escalate. In other words, uh, Bibi Netanyahu has made it very clear that his own political ambitions and his own direct political future may depend on being able to make this into a larger war so that he can eradicate Hamas. If that's the case, I think that US-China, which should be a mitigating factor, we should have a uh, similar perspective to try to stop uh, escalation of war, could find ourselves in a dangerous situation where you have two conflicts that basically Ukrainians and Israelis are focused on their specific e interests in the region. You have two superpowers that are incredibly distracted, and then you have elections in Taiwan, you have elections in Korea. The only place I feel good about right now is a Tokyo, and that, 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 I'm glad to be back for that reason, but that, that doesn't give me that much confidence in the future. And, and the last point, I said that last time, is that when you look at the BRICS, I mean, there's so many things here in geopolitics. Your job, our jobs are very interesting. With the BRICS expanding, mostly with Arab states, guess what? This Israel situation is not just a regional conflict. It becomes global. And without the G7 and the G20, uh, by the way, at the UN, the only permanent Security Council member that came was the United States. Russia couldn't come. China chose not to come. India didn't come. Britain and France were having their own bromance. If Trump gets reelected, NATO as we know it and Europe, uh, US, Japan, US uh, Europe alliance is not in the same state that the US Japan alliance is. So again, I come back to Japan needs to take a larger role and I'm begging you to play that role because we need it in the United States right now. Wow, uh, that's a lot of task. <laughs> um, but I guess that uh, there are, uh, I think, uh, real change of uh, dynamics, then we definitely need to prepare uh, for what's going to happen uh, next year. And for that, I'd like to open the floor, and we do have uh, 18 minutes to go, and take uh, two or three questions at the, uh, at the first round, and then to you know, uh, get back to the, uh, the panelists. Please, uh, gentlemen, on the first floor. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, last week I just met with some Taiwanese companies, so I hear what you're saying. They're, they're just free and they're like, no problem at all, so I'm glad to hear that. Now, I'd like to hear your opinions on Japan from South Korea and Taiwan's point of view. Ma, America too, if you want to, but uh, do you think that Japan's being proactive enough in the region with Taiwan and South Korea in the uh, geopolitical sense of things? Thank you. Right, any, any other question at this moment? Um, okay, Hori-san. Yeah, um, my question is also uh, t about Taiwan. I was really uh, great to hear that, that Taiwan is no problem, but uh, can, can you just uh, tell us a little bit more about the, the what the, the, be the rationale behind that the why the, the why is not coming? That would be f fantastic, thank you. Okay, anyone? Okay, let's, oh, all right, please, gentlemen. Mm. Sorry, my name is Hildun Azhari. I'm a correspondent for our New Japan, which is partner here. And uh, I am from not not from the business, so my uh, I have a question uh, about your comments about the Israeli situation. I'm originally from Syria, and I think about two million, two hundred million Arabs are celebrating what Hamas did. Probably one billion Muslims are ahead of the uh, also on along with that. And uh, I think in your comments you ignore totally that Israel is occupation for many years, and uh, you also didn't mention the practices by Israel against the Palestinians that has been causing all of these problems. And I think if, if the occupation ends, the, we will not have any more uh, situations like that. Do you agree to this? Thank you. Okay, so this is the very much benefit of the G1 Global, uh, representing uh, different you know sectors uh, of the world, which really brings about the comprehensive uh, viewpoint of the, the dynamics of what's been uh, going on. So, several questions to the Foucault, and then Gina, and then finally Joshua. First, uh, thank you for for the question, and basically in Taiwan, uh, limited by political react. Uh, Perhaps I should use this uh, real politics. Every one of the government in the world, and also especially in Asia, try to play down any connection with Taiwan, even with a real uh, necessity. But they don't want to speak up. They don't want to implement something. So I really concur with your question. Maybe this question should directly address to Prime Minister of Japan uh, today. <laughs> And what do you hear uh, from the first panel uh, when uh, the similar question was asked and the response was uh, referring to democracy? Uh, Taiwan is more than democracy. Uh, we have uh, so much 
uh, states to be connected with Japan and also other countries. So what I'm saying is uh, you're, you are really on the same page with, with me. Um, uh, at this moment, we are actually, for the first time in uh, such a long uh, period of time, we are trying to work with our Japanese uh, experts and colleagues, which we might gradually move beyond business dem democratic uh, cooperation. Looking into the defense area, which is a taboo uh, for the government now, um, I, I, everyone remember the Japanese government last year already announced uh, three important documents over almost uh, over a uh, hold of uh, entire defense structure, expanding the, uh, the defense expenditure and rather relevant things, but never touch upon Taiwan. Uh, after that, we can hear a number of uh, politicians from Tokyo maybe saying something, and the government keeps uh, completely uh, silent of, of this line. But I know uh, under the table, so much has been going on but we haven't just uh, come to that strategic point yet. And since uh, Korea also making a great change uh, in defense structure, as well as the Japan. So basically, we are all facing to the similar or the same uh, security challenge from China. So we need to get the wars uh, well prepared. And I, I think this may be shared completely by a regional country. So if uh, there would be something we can go much further, that is uh, the area, uh, maybe beyond business area, we need to really start thinking of uh, whether we might be work together on the strategic uh, communi uh, community area. Uh, okay, uh, come to your, your question quickly. Um, this is a real uh, important question. Why people in Taiwan and also some uh, corners uh, in the global community think that the war is not coming in the Taiwan Strait. Basically, I can uh, s summarize into very simple words. Because uh, when Tiger is uh, very busy and also uh, feeling some difficulty uh, in his uh, body, don't mess up with, with the Tiger. And don't provoke the Tiger. If you provoke, even if uh, he, he has uh, some problem inside, he will try to uh, bite and also re response. And basically, uh, this is uh, something we need to bear uh, in mind. Um, also, uh, looking why Taiwanese are not really worrying about, except our government, uh, worrying about the war is coming, reflecting what uh, Josh's uh, uh, key point, politicians in Washington, D.C. are now thinking uh, completely differently. Let me take this uh, into the picture. Uh, American think tanks and Japanese uh, think tanks in the last uh, two, three years conducting uh, the war game in the Taiwan Strait, mostly looking into how Taiwan should defend to the final war, uh, final days around the doom days. So you will see the scenario in Ukraine and also possibly reflecting the scenario in Israel today. Men and women should carry guns or fight in our street. But that is uh, the mindset, or probably the policy mindset in Washington, D.C., preparing for war. But if you are really projecting uh, your country for, for war, the war is coming much uh, sooner. But this is the reason why my group uh, in Taiwan lately just uh, conducted very unprecedented uh, war game. We are looking much beyond the so-called D, uh, D minus 30 which uh, before uh, the, the doom day, what we are going to do, and basically we are thinking deter, deterring the war, not uh, allowing the war happening. So if uh, we can do this, we should think more comprehensively, working with our friends and allies in the region, from supply chain, from communication, uh, from cybersecurity, and also other energy supply, all that dimension. Because after we run through this war game, we realize how vulnerable Taiwan is and also how vulnerable our friends all together is. If the war is really coming, uh, Korea, Japan, Canada, the U US, and Taiwan, all those uh, trade will be disrupted. No trade, no energy supply for some time to come. So that may be the same scenario. So what I'm saying, this is a geopolitical level 
a reason why the war is not happening. But into the real point, uh, many people challenge uh, Xi Jinping is not stable lately. But he has uh, some problem domestically, for sure. But for this reason, uh, in Taiwan, we have uh, failed since uh, early this year. Our opposition party uh, paid a visit to Beijing. And after certain round of uh, discussion, uh, China already changed uh, the policy. Before this year, uh, Xi Jinping already highlighted reunification is the ultimate goal for China. But now he is uh, talking more about peaceful unification because uh, he understands after the war, if Taiwan uh, went, uh, goes uh, through this, uh, this war, everything will be burned down, destroyed, nothing useful. And he cannot tell Chinese people in mainland China why he killed uh, the same people. And that would, would not be something on the political side. So I, I think uh, the final message is many people in the world, especially American uh, politicians, only look into military aspect. But we are in the region. We know there are a lot more aspects we need to pay more attention to. Once we look into this particular area, I don't think Xi Jinping will give an order to, to invade Taiwan anytime. But of course, Taiwan already uh, vulnerable enough. Uh, actually, uh, China does not need to mobilize the military. They can really easily paralyze uh, Taiwan. Uh, the final point is just looking into the pandemic last year in 2022, Taiwan's uh, overall uh, trade, global trade, counted for more than 41% was with China. So we, we are under such a difficulty. You are, uh, you are uh, perhaps what I can say, we, our survival depends uh, so much on Chinese market. But now, security-wise, uh, political-wise, our government is now setting away, really plunge Taiwan into much more difficult and dangerous uh, situation. So this may be difficult, not easy for the government in Taipei to manage well. But that is uh, the reason why we are hoping the next government will lead us into a much more balanced uh, position. Thank you. Well, thank you, Huko. That was uh, very uh, insightful. Uh, over to you, Gina. Uh, the question uh, was about how, whether Japan is doing enough uh, on Korea, but whatever uh, the other issues that sh you, you want to take up, uh, uh, Gina, uh, that's your floor. Yes, thank you. Uh, let me talk about Japan. Um, South Korea has taken always two track approach toward Japan, uh, separating security issue from historical issues. And even under the Moon administration, future oriented cooperation was the principle for South Korea's policy toward Japan. And historical issue will never go away, obviously, but uh, when it comes to priority, security cooperation will come first. Um, under this situation. Uh, perhaps how we see Japan may differ between President Yoon and people in South Korea, especially with regard to issues these days like uh, the release of treated water, for example. Yes, we have an election coming up, uh, but I think the US does not need to uh, expect dramatic change in the foreign policy after uh, the general election. The issues uh, during South Korea's general election next year in April will be mostly focused on domestic issues. The economy, real estate, and education will be the main issues. And therefore, foreign affairs are uh, that that issue will not be expected to be a major issue. And the next presidential election will not take place for another three and a half years. So foreign policy will come uh, continue uh, for some time. What we are worrying about is rather the US uh, election in November next year. And South Korea, uh, because South Korea declared that it, it is going to be a people state, a uh, global people state. Scholars have different definitions of a people country, uh, but uh, for South Korean government, people means a people to the Indo-Pacific and a commitment to contributing more to the existing international order. And then makes uh, Japan and South Korea natural partners. I'll stop there, thanks. Thanks, Gina and Joshua. 
I appreciate the question. Uh, as you can probably imagine, uh, as a recovering uh, diplomat who doesn't currently wear the American flag, it's hard not to instinctively respond in the way I've been trained. But as a human being, uh, it's obvious in my comments that from a personal point of view, of course, uh, what, what has been going on for a very long time in Palestine is something that uh, needs to be addressed by the world. I would simply say that it's the wrong time to focus on that particular issue after such a tragedy. And I agree with your statement. Your bottom line was there's probably only 200,000 Palestinians and only a million Muslims. I agree. And when I look at the voices in Turkey in particular, I was surprised at how direct and how sympathetic. And I actually hope that this can be a moment to bring us together. My fear is that the worst politics in all of our countries will prevail. You're from Syria. I used to work for the Obama administration. The red line that was drawn in your country uh, uh, did not help your people. Uh, and I still, to this day, am frustrated by that process. And my fear is that it's going to be hard to trust any country, particularly a country like the United States that has uh, wanted to be a provider of security for the world. And the point for, unfortunately, my Palestinian brothers and sisters is they've been abandoned by everybody. Right? And so the Gulf, uh, you know, kind of the Abrahamic Accords, uh, hopefully we're a chance to bring people together. When I was in the State Department, I work with Palestinian entrepreneurs, and I can guarantee you, you have never seen entrepreneurs like the Palestinians, and the people there are unbelievable. So to try to paint all of these people with the brush of Hamas and the worst of humanity in that case as terrorists, and the way that Iran is so quickly and easily taking credit and then trying to instigate more major problems is very frustrating, because to me, there seems to be more people of goodwill on one side, but just like in politics, the extreme elements are the worst here. And I think it takes people like ourselves, civil society, not government officials, to step forward. You know, I'm the president of Japan Society. Uh, we don't do anything related to this topic, and I'm sure my staff and many people uh, who are members get very uncomfortable when they hear me speak in this way. But I think it's actually really important to reinforce how important these ties of kizuna, right? This is a great Japanese word, a word that goes beyond connection, because connections are just kind of transactions. If we focus on just transactions, in this particular case, everybody's going to be a loser here. The Israelis are going to lose. There are many Israelis who are very unhappy with the way this is playing out. But there's a time and there's a place. In the same way that after 9-11, we had to come together and rally and try to focus on that, that was the first Afghan invasion. But by the time the war in Iraq was beginning, people's patience had worn thin. And so I'm very concerned that when you have a war on terror that is in a nation state framework, it's going to get more difficult. And if America, with our own politics, decides to sit out of this equation, then what do other countries do? How can Japan be a leader in that space if its entire security is tied to a country that sometimes you're not sure at any given moment what an American politician will or won't do? I can assure you the way American politics work is probably the same as the way your politics work. All politics is local. And I think at a certain point, it is going to take all of us in this room who have abilities to not say, oh, those politicians, they're horrible, but to get engaged in the civic process. And to me, that is what's needed. And in this case, you know, when there's a war going on, you first have to get the security piece out of control and then we have to move forward. So I appreciate you being here and appreciating the question. Uh, sorry if I can't be even more uh, uh, large in my answer, but I'm sure Rahm Emanuel, who knows a lot about these questions, would love to answer the question directly on behalf of the U.S. government, which I cannot speak for. Well, but, but th thank you so much. I think uh, this also has been, you know, reflecting the, you know, the diversity of the viewpoints uh, of the world and bringing in those perspectives into the G1 Global is the, uh, you know, the maximum benefit that we have uh, in, in this floor. Since I, I need to, you know, wrap uh, the, the session up uh, in a few minutes, uh, but m if I may uh, mention a couple of things about Japan. Uh, one thing is that uh, our politics may not be as stable as uh, what, uh, what you expect. <laughs> uh, we have uh, lost the track of the timing of the dissolution of the lower house, which has uh, lots of behind the scene. Uh, and, and that will be a kind of in advent of uh, something might happen uh, in the next rounds. And the magnitude is getting higher uh, on this, so that the politics needs to be uh, looked very carefully. Uh, in Japan. And uh, secondly, on the three documents that the Li Fuko uh, has mentioned, and I think uh, the Taiwan definitely uh, is the tacit concept, uh, you know, underlying the why we need to reform uh, our uh, defense policy in a such a drastic uh, scale. And we are going to obtain the capability that might enough to deny the 
Chinese prospect of the operational success whenever they face with Taiwan, Senkaku, South China Sea, or, or whatever. And uh, that is, the, I think, at the concept uh, of our deterrence, probably deterrence by denial, but it's, uh, I think, uh, essential field to be, uh, you know, mes uh, str uh, me messaging strategically to Beijing that the oil operation, whenever you change the status, uh, change the status quo by force, that's not going to be successful. And this is, the I think, the message that we are going to prepare. And eventually, um, Joshua mentioned about the BRICS and the emerging uh, economy. And this is a field, definitely, that uh, whenever we talk about alliance and uh, democratic coalition, we should not just look at each other. We should engage in the new reality uh, of the world and then bringing in uh, those kind of assets into the alliance politics. And this is uh, what uh, I think a new generation uh, needs to uh, engage more time in the global south, more uh, you know, time in the emerging economy, and that will energize uh, our renewal of the alliance relationship. And with that, uh, I, I'm sorry that I, <laughs> I became the, the person to wrap things up, but uh, uh, thanks uh, so much for joining uh, this session. And please join me by thanking all the panelists for their great discussion. Thank you.